TTS Talking Early Years Podcast and I am Alice Sharp, your host for today. So, oh my goodness me, we've talked about play, we've talked about play-based learning, we've talked about us as the adults. What I'd love to think about now with you, Mariana, is the environments, the environments, the spaces and places. I have just spent three days with Sandra Duncan um, and just gloriously talking about spaces and places and how we need to enrich, entice and elevate the thinking and engagement of our children. I love a mud kitchen. We love a mud kitchen. Lots of utensils to stimulate response in my home corners. How do we make it all exciting? You know, how do we make sure that a child who's been with us from they were six months old and they're still with us at four, the home corner or the mud kitchen or the block area are still inviting them in? How do we do that? So this is one of my areas of expertise and I absolutely love it. And I'm going to go back to refer the play schemas because once again, this is huge. This is huge in child development and this is huge into you making spaces and into you having these rich experiences. I also want to emphasize that building a learning space takes time. And it is, I like to say, I add elements year after year, year after year. Some I buy, some are free. It's about making, having a balance, but we cannot actually think that we're going to have this amazing space from year one. So it's about no. growing with your space. And this is part of the beauty of our profession. I don't want teachers to get disencouraged because they don't have this amazing learning space, which I, I get them. I get them. I see where that's coming from. But I think that we also have to um, praise that we are growing and we are evolving with our teachers. So that is part of also the environments. The environments that I absolutely um, like to see in a space, but it all depends on your space, how big it is, how yeah. what possibilities do you have? How many have. corners you have? <laughs> Correct. Correct. And I see it right now. Again, Alice, I renovated my garage and I have to make it work and I already have too much in there and I need to, I don't want to overdo it because children get overwhelmed. Completely. And that's something that we need to consider. How much is too much? You don't need too much. You need enough. So um, the first learning space that is crucial for me is block play and open-ended play. Okay. In block play, I love, and if you follow me on my social media, you know that I'm a loose parts lover and you will find loose parts all over my learning environment, but loose parts are a must. They yeah. live in the block play and but they also go to different environments every now and then. Uh, they live in the block play. We have a huge block play collection um, with blocks of different sizes because children like to actually experiment with sizes. And um, you will see that as part of the play development, younger children like larger um, buildups, whether when they start, well, I also do elementary now because I'm moving with my students and that starts to actually, the building starts to get smaller and we, more details and tiny little things. But in the early years, they love to play with different sizes of blocks. So I definitely love having this block play environment with different sizes of blocks. I love to add loose parts and I have commercial loose parts and recycled material loose parts. All the inserts of the uh, fabrics, the rolls, the tubes. Um, I also yeah. have uh, the spools of um that people uh, yeah. actually don't use anymore i and those are they love them and you know what i've discovered needs in my children and i've noted i've noticed how i have these lap tables where they use for sex for um flexible city and they are using the upper part to build so i noticed that they needed larger surfaces to use as roofs as and as floors so your group will actually tell you what to add because you will see the play schemas which within the building. Building is crucial because building will develop all 21st century skills. 
We want children to be 21st century learners, to be able to collaborate, to um, make decisions, to problem solve, to be leaders, to actually um, be innovative. We as teachers, even though it's an open-ended play experience, at the beginning, we do have to be part of that play because we will teach children all these social cues and components and moderate behaviors within children. So let's say if you have a three and a four year old arguing about a specific block, you will model how to have a conversation rather than just fight over a block. So this is such a rich teaching area because you will be teaching 21st century skills and social emotional skills. So a block play center is huge. I also recommend that we have an open space in front of the block play so that children can actually move freely and build freely in that area. That would be my and, first. Sorry to interrupt, but would you, so block play for me and perhaps for some of our listeners is about wooden blocks, but you've described your loose parts coming into that as well of the spools. And, and, and for me, block play is slightly different to what we would call our terminology would be constructive play. So constructing something where we would use big catalogues and books and um, TTS have got lovely um, see-through bricks and I've got here little whiskey stones. So we would use these in our block play area, sponges. Um, and I think that one of the things that educators get themselves in a twist about is that when it says block play, they just use blocks, but you have described beautifully how you enrich and enhance the block play area. And I think I that's the difference between- about this, Alice. I wanted to think about this. I think about block play as the body of the learning. So you have larger pieces of constructive items, whatever it means. Blocks, magnetic tiles, whatever large items, that's your body, that's what you should start having. Okay. You add the earrings and the rings and all those details into your block or constructive play area, which will be the loose parts, all these tiny details that will yeah. add up and will enrich those that building process. So I like to see it as a, like the body is the larger, are the larger elements. And then we add up tiny details based on the child's interest. And I that's where the loose parts jump in into the building. That's a nice way of looking at it. Yeah, cool. And what about the home corner then or the art area? Do, are they, they separate? What do you do? Would we have them all out at the same time? What do you think? Yeah. Uh, well, so we have the block area. Then absolutely, I would have an art area. Right now, I don't have the space, but I would absolutely love. We are so afraid of displaying art materials out for children because it's messy. So if you want an art area, you have to think first that we always teach children how to use the material before actually providing the material out to children. And it is doable, even if it's messy. Right now, I don't have a large area to create yeah. a beautiful art setup, but I have an art cart and children pull out the tablecloth to protect the tables and they set up the paint. And I've spent a lot of time teaching them how much to squirt on, like inside a container to grab paint, how to use the tempera sticks, how to use the glue. That's part of this teaching that happens in the early years. And if we teach all how to use all these materials, we are encouraging independence in the long run. Like I see my eight-year-old since she's six, she takes out all the art supplies and she does all these messy activities. And at the end of the mess, she cleans up. So it is about teaching our students how to use the material, how to engage into it. Something that happens a lot, and I am going to refer to this, is that children like and tend to start doing something and then they leave. And this is something that we want to address. And it, it is normal for children to do this, but that's part of setting agreements for the specific um, areas. How does art look like here? 
what are our, ma- our, our two goals? For example, in my, in my um, space, they know if you start, you finish. You already decided to start here. And if you don't want to finish, you have to clean it up and move to the other area if you want. Okay. Um, we do not rotate in the spaces. They choose where they want to go. Yeah. And um, so, yes, art is absolutely a must. I strongly... One of the... You you sound as if you have a, a kind of re, um, smaller space than some people would have, eh, Mariana. And one of the ways that we got around that doing art was we have frisbees, you know, a frisbee eh, or a washing up bowl. And so if we've got six children in that space, we'll have six washing up bowls or six frisbees. And that is their palette to paint on. So that is their their kind of boundary of painting on. So we might, I'm holding up the at the moment, guys, eh, I know it's a podcast, but these are little beer mats, but the children can, so they would put them on the frisbee or in the washing up bowl. And that might be where they're doing. And I'm sitting here with um, Jackson Pollock earrings on, an artist's earrings on, in fact. Uh, Jackson Pollock's an American splash artist, for anybody who's listening and doesn't know. Um, and we have used treacle, so molasses, sugar, and toothpaste in the, the bowls uh, by splashing and dripping and that confined space means that the child is so in charge um, and so committed um, you know that that we don't see them losing interest in the task and 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 de kind of connecting um, and walk, walking off to do something else because they're so focused on this tiny little area that is my area and I am going to create something spectacular. And so there's always solutions. So you've given us beautiful solutions to, you know, that limitation sometimes that we have. But I love the fact that you're encouraging their children to really think about finishing as well because, again, um, in a lot of places around the world, that would not be... Um, you know, the children are allowed to free flow and follow their own ag- agenda and their own route. And, you know, I'll, I've, I've heard people using Piaget's schema as a, an excuse to have a messy mm-hmm. room. Well, if that's where they're leaving it, they, they, they might come back for it. But, well, if they don't come back within half an hour, are they still going to come back for it? So there's loads of um, myths and legends, I guess, about these areas that we set up. I'm wondering about also the, the home corner so you you've described beautifully the block play and the loose parts the home corner is something that i feel really strongly about and in fact i've just written a, a blog for tts about it but um the the reason i feel strongly about it is because we work with a huge amount of children in abject poverty and, and deprivation and it's the most important home that they're going to spend time in um but what i would love people to do Um, is to stand in their block area or their loose part area or their art area or their home corner and ask themselves why do I have this here what why have I thought that the home corner is important or the block area is important or the art area why 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 you know what is my role as an adult in the home corner is a different role to the home the, the role I will play in the block area so how do you feel about that the importance then of knowing that in the home corner I might do um, occupational role play, fantasy role play, real life role play, and that might be what I'm encouraging or I want them to um, feel comfortable about healthy eating or do our staff, do our educators know and ask that question enough, do you think, Mariana? And that's an amazing question, Alice, because these three areas, well, uh, pretend play, block play and art are the areas that are more child led and that are more um, open. And it's where all these 21st century skills and I absolutely love adults to back away from these areas, but these areas also need adult intervention, which is different in the playful learning. You are engaging with the children almost at all times. In these other spaces, you want children to actually show you the way. Here, we, again, we observe, but we as a, as educators, we have the responsibility of providing the right materials for the spaces in the home area. I like... Um, Right now I have like a kitchen and some dolls and 
I also talk to children about the importance of all these three environments. What do they develop? How do um, actually in the world, people think that it's not okay to, for boys to play with dolls, but we are proving them wrong because it is more than okay to play with dolls. It's more than okay to cook. So we all cook. And believe it or not, we have these conversations around the usage of the spaces. In the block play, how do we clean up? Clean up is part of playing. We might leave up some of the structures if you wanna continue playing with them the next day, but you will clean up all the loose parts around it. So first, you want to make sure that children know how to use these environments. That's your job as an educator. Number two, you want to make sure that the children understand the importance of the environments. And it's not that they're gonna recite the skills, but it makes your, strong, your brain strong. It is your responsibility to be here playing. And I always encourage teachers to back away from that feeling that they have to sit on the rug and play with the doll and build and interact with the child. That only happens if you see a child who's struggling, if they invite you to build, because most of the time they don't want you there. They don't want you being part of the play. But um, let's say if you see a child that is struggling or has no purpose or is throwing the materials or there's, it's clearly, it's an indicator that the child, let's say in the block play is not engaging with the toys because probably he needs a little bit more modeling. And it's not that we're gonna teach the child, this is how we build a tower, but you sit next to a child and you prompt the child, how about what would you like to build? And they would say, I don't know. Well, this looks like a park. I'm going to add this block. How about you? What would you like to add? And little by little, you start, you will start that scaffolding to provide the confidence for that child to continue building. The same thing happens in the home area. I love switching things around like once a month. Again, Alice, remember that I'm in, on that team of less is more and you cannot overdo it because it won't last so yeah. let's say for valentine's i do like a love kitchen and i just add some um different uh, valentine colors objects and i do some prompts for baking and on halloween here in the states it's so common we do like a potion making station for a creepy cafe and let's say if i don't have a specific um, theme, I will just arrange the dolls in a different way for one week, and then I'll move the food in a different way. And let's say if you want to do a talk about healthy eating, can we make a menu and can we feed our children brain food? And then you can also have the writing workshop or center collaborate with the pretend play because that's also something that's very powerful. All these areas live together. They're in the same learning space. And you will see the children going to the art center and building and creating something for the, in my, in my learning environment, they are all about um, labels. So they're always creating labels for restaurant at the block play and they just tape it up. So yeah. it's about engaging enough, but not a lot because yeah, that it, and I think you're right there because I think that's the hardest one of the hardest parts of our job is to know when to step into the play and when to stay away from the play and Julie Fisher has written the most phenomenal book um, Interaction versus Interfering uh, or Interrupting and uh, you know and I think that that's where staff either use it as an excuse not to engage and or, or all they do is ask questions where we need to think about um, inviting children to elaborate on how they're engaging we need to make suggestions about how they might move forward we need to reflect on what it is they're engaging we need to reinforce by offering useful suggestions we need to clarify their ideas we need to echo their comments we need to do, we, we play so many roles as the adult as a partner in that play as a playful partner in um, the observer the extender the encouragers the facilitator the communicator all of these roles and and so we need to know them all understand them all but know when to use them and when to not use them <laughs> and, uh, and in environments that are going to encourage me to play deeply deeply play and um, to wallow in it is just so important. Well, oh 
my goodness me, that has just been a joy and a, an honour and a privilege to share time with you today, Mariana. I cannot thank you enough for joining us on our podcast today. Uh, so all it leaves me to say is a huge thank you on behalf of everybody that's uh, tuning in um, to you for being with us and for sharing all of that fabulous insight into how play can really make a difference and make an impact for our children. Mm -hmm.